So picture this. One day you see this box sitting on the shelf at Blockbuster Video. The year is 1996, and you're 8 years old. You have absolutely no concept of what this is, because RPGs are incredibly niche outside of Japan. But you sure as heck know who this is. Now, you're young enough that you have no personal memory of the NES, and while Mario games may be fun, you don't really see them with the reverence that the older kids do. Still, the dude's so synonymous with gaming that even your parents know who he is, so there's no way you're not gonna play a game with him in it. The stage is set, and you know how these Mario games go by now. Yes, Bowser's kidnapped the princess, yes, Mario's gotta go rescue her, and... you're already there. The game gives you control for the first time, just as Mario sets foot on Bowser's doorstep. Huh. But you don't really even get to process how odd it is to be starting here with the castle level. Before you encounter some bad guys, try to jump on one because, you know, that's kind of how it works in every game you've ever played, and... What? You jumped on an enemy, and it didn't die. It wiped to a completely different screen, and now there are three of them, and they're all just, just standing there, hanging out, walking in place. What's this? What's this? What is... Wait, you know what that is. Aha! Jump! Jump! I mean, that's what you were trying to do in the first place, but yeah! But now you can't move. Oh, your number went down. Okay, so they make your numbers go down, and you make theirs go down? Each face button always corresponds to an action. The interface only displays information when it's relevant, it doesn't confuse or overwhelm you with, like, an abundance of numbers. Basically, it's so intuitive that even if you're 8 years old and have never experienced turn-based combat before, you can still figure it out. After a single hallway of guards and a straight walk over a lava lake, you come to a chandelier room. This awesome remix of the final battle theme from Mario 3 kicks up, and it's time to clean Bowser's clock! But Toadstool fills you in. You're actually aiming for his chain? Ah, yes, of course. Mario can just hang in midair over the chasm and throw a punch like seven feet away to damage the chain. Uh, also, the game just taught you that you can target different things in battle, and you probably didn't even notice that. Well, the combat presented a bit of a learning curve, but hey, Bowser's been foiled again, the princess is saved, and I gotta say, that vacation came a lot easier than the last one. All's well that ends well, right? The discordant image of an impossibly enormous sword sheathed into a castle is everything to this game. It represents both the inciting incident and the goal you're working toward. It's the symbol of everything that went wrong and everything that you need to set right. It dominates at the top of the world map, appears all over the game's packaging and marketing, and even permanently scars the title screen. Super Mario RPG is not a very serious game, but it presents this moment and the threat that it implies with absolute sincerity. Hours from now, when Mario is chasing a madman up a mountain and hopping over barrels, it's still there, looming over the horizon. Don't forget what happened, don't forget what you're fighting for. And that's the tone in a nutshell. The epic air of a more traditional RPG always hangs in the periphery but it's juxtaposed against the light-hearted whimsy of a Mario game. Uh, case in point, the sword freaking talks. Well, of course. Its name is Exor, and it says that this episode of the Geek Critique is sponsored by you guys. Back TGC at patreon.com slash geekcritique to get early access to videos, hang out with me in an exclusive Discord chat, and get behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to all my supporters. I literally couldn't do any of this without you. Okay. Exor actually explains via slightly clunky, slightly very obviously translated from Japanese exposition that this represents the first conquest of the Smithy Gang, an invading race of sentient weaponry. Then Exor collapses the bridge to Bowser's Keep, and not even Mario can jump that far. So if we can't go this away, yeah, we'll have to go that away. This game doesn't feature a contiguous world map like many Square games of its era. Instead, areas are segmented into points on a world map. It's kind of like stages in a platformer, and how about that? It is the same concept. Beat a level, unlock the next one, progress onward. But while some areas are built like Mario action stages with Goombas and Koopa Troopas and light platforming, 
An RPG also needs its traditional towns, rest stops, and yes, kingdoms. For as many castles as Mario had taken down to this point, this is the first time the games had ever depicted the central hub of the Mushroom Kingdom. We'd never actually seen where Princess Toadstool and her subjects live when Bowser's not, like, turning everyone into bricks. There's a couple who are going off to get married soon, a shopkeep who's hilariously particular about following RPG conventions, and a little kid who just hero worships Mario for his bravery, his fortitude, and... No, it's just his jumping ability. As was the style at the time, Mario is a silent protagonist through and through. But he's not just an empty vessel for the player. The game sort of centers his jumping ability as his calling card. Over and over, awestruck citizens will demand to know if you really are Mario. And how do you prove it? The games you've played, the battles Mario's waged, those events are canon to this game, and that kind of legacy isn't something that a pure platformer would really have room to show. Mario's reputation precedes him, he's already a renowned hero in this world. But there's also something kind of, like, endearingly outdated about the way Mario is portrayed here. Like, there's this sequence where Mario sneaks into a villain's palace by disguising himself as a statue, a piece called A Plumber's Lament. Observe the thick mustache, covering the sad, innocent smile of a simple fool. Yeah, I don't know if Nintendo would describe their mascot that way these days. Mario is simple, sure, but he's always portrayed first and foremost as this determined, but jubilant, ultimate icon of video games. But back in the before times, Nintendo tended to emphasize their mascot as more of a blue-collar everyman. This is a subtle difference, I know, but like he's not even a plumber anymore! But in any era, Mario is still a flat character. He's a steadfast, determined hero, but it's not like he's gonna have an arc. Rather, his actions affect the characters he interacts with. And nobody has more of an arc than Mallow. When you first meet Mallow, he's almost the inverse of Mario. He claims to be a frog, but he literally can't jump. When a chunky purple freak wagon named Croco steals his money, Mallow's not strong enough, or courageous enough, or good at jumping enough to get it back. Oh, he wants to be brave, but when push comes to shove, he just bursts into tears. And when Mallow cries, so too do the clouds. Mallow can control the weather. You know, like frogs do. But Mario is everything he's not. Strong, brave, good at jumping. And so Mario takes this very definitely absolutely a tadpole under his wing. And this says something. It might have seemed obvious to have someone we know as Mario's first partner. The series even then had no shortage of characters to pull from, but we put a ton of spotlight this early in the game on someone new. And in fact, the first two party members we get are unique to this game. Having broken the Mario formula to start, Square front-loaded the game this way to help it stand out and to ensure that it would have its own identity. In combat, Mario and Mallow are complementary in their contrast. Mario's usual role in an ensemble is the jack-of-all-trades master of none, but here he's more of a direct damage specialist, and an absolute master of that trade. His attacks are powerful, his specials are deadly, he's always useful, always solid, always super, and he better be, because he is the one character that you can never take out of the party. His one sort of weakness is an inability to damage multiple enemies at once until late in the game. Mallow, then, starts as a little weak sauce crybaby whose fists are made out of cotton balls and constantly needs healing and pick-me-ups. But he's also a weather-controlling demigod who can strike down the entire enemy team in a single flash of lightning. Mallow has a niche. Gimmicky special moves with unique, but extremely useful functions. Those specials, by the way, run on flower points, which function as a shared pool between all your party members. But you don't get more FP by leveling up. You get more FP by exploring the world, talking to people, and most importantly, playing the hero. It's a great way to incentivize the player to roleplay as Mario. However, Mallow doesn't jump, Mario doesn't summon a giant snowman, Mallow doesn't blast fireballs. What might be customizable in another game are exclusive character powers in this one. Aside from choosing a level-up bonus, these three slots are all the customization you get. And you know, that was more than enough for someone who'd never played an RPG before. Customizable equipment was and is a hallmark of the genre, but it wasn't exactly common in games outside of it. But the first action area has a mini-boss, a pair of Hammer Brothers. And when you beat them, Mario RPG shines an enormous spotlight on the fact that one of their hammers got left behind. It gives context to a weapon upgrade. At this point, the more thoughtful player might open up the menu and see what they can do with that hammer. Huh, Mario can use this, and now his attack's completely different and way stronger. 
And don't worry if you're like me and you're not more thoughtful, Mario RPG still clues you in later. With a couple of exceptions, both weapons and armor become more powerful in a linear fashion. There's not much in the way of trade-offs to consider or strategy to employ. Mario's Punch Glove is a straight upgrade from the Knock Knock Shell, Mallow's Mega Pants are for bigger boys than the Thick Pants. I get why you'd want to keep things simple, but armor upgrades in particular wind up feeling a little bit arbitrary. You find a new shop, buy slightly better stuff for everyone, swap the equipment around, and sell all the old stuff. It works, sure, it's just very, you know, standard. I do have to commend the interface for being so well designed, though. You can manage your equipment without ever leaving the shop menu. But that third slot, accessories, that's a different story. While some can be bought, they're much more often rewards for optional challenges and exploration. Some of them are your standard charms that prevent status effects, but you've also got accessories that double your coins or experience, shoes that let Mario jump on any enemy, and one that'll make a noise when you're on a screen with a hidden chest. Accessories aren't that deep or anything, but they do give you a wider range of options to consider without overwhelming you with choice. And this may well be the game's modus operandi to streamline the complexity of an RPG into the accessibility of an action platformer, balancing the depth of one with the wider appeal of the other. The approach to status effects is another good example. No matter what ails ya, whether it's poison, sleep, or being turned into a scarecrow, a single item called Able Juice is always the cure. And considering you've got limited inventory space and items do not stack, that's a relief. This also means there's a layer of strategy in considering what items to keep and when to use them. But only a layer. Status effects are cured at the end of battle. Yeah, even this one. Woo, he's not dead! Once you belt Croco and get Mallow's money back, it's time to head back to the Mushroom Kingdom. Uh-oh. This, once again, is a case of Mario RPG framing its antagonists as a threat. What was this bouncy, happy beacon of Toadstool sovereignty is now under siege by the Smithy Gang. The quirky, charming townsfolk now cower in their homes, terrorized by these creepy, bouncing shysters. Or sometimes not so terrorized? Come on, kid, I thought I was your hero! All this doom and gloom has been wrought by one of Smithy's lieutenants, a sentient knife called Mac, who has, of course, taken the throne room. If the symbol of everything you're fighting against is a giant sword, then it's kind of funny that the first Smithy ganger you fight is a, comparatively speaking, teeny tiny knife. Although back in 96, I thought this was that. I mean, look, he crashed down the same way and everything. I guess he just got smaller. I was a dumb kid. The knife is sent to the afterlife, and he left behind a star. Oh, let me just pick it up here. I'll... Hmm. Mm-hmm. If I didn't know better, I'd say this thing was important. Even though we have no idea what these stars are, or why they're significant, the game sure goes out of its way to make it clear that they are. It'll be quite a while before we find out why. But first, we've gotta head to Tadpole Pond and find out that... Mallow is not a tadpole! Well, no doy. Sorry, do people not say that anymore? We said it a lot in 96. Mallow floated down the river in a basket when he was a baby, and an old man turtle kermit named Frog Fuchus took him in. Clearly, this game is overflowing with Japanese pop culture references that no American kid back then would have caught. But now, the only frog their figure Mallow has ever known tells him it's time to go out into the world and find his real family. And Mallow puts on a brave face. Attaboy. A little way down the road at the Rose Town Inn, Mario walks in on a kid named Yaz playing Mario with his toys. Gaz wants you as Mario to play Mario while playing Mario, but he's gonna play as his favorite toy, a doll named... Chino. As a kid myself at the time, I found this scene so relatable. Gaz's excitement, his mom's dumb grown-up concerns, the nostalgic music that's... Oh, hang on, I've got something in my eye. This never fails to make me smile. Chino's gonna finish the fight with a shooting star shot! And... Uh, whoa. Mario, who let's remember can get diced, charged, and crushed and keep on fighting, just got KO'd by a toy. That doll packs a wallop. That night, an otherworldly presence visits the inn. Light shines down from the heavens and... Gino is real. 
Hmm, and this scene plays over a remix of the Starpiece collection theme from earlier. What could it mean? The doll stumbles, walking around on two legs for the first time, and slams headfirst into the stairs. Then leaves without a word. The next morning, Gaz tells his mom that he saw Gino going into the forest! She reacts like the cynical, boring adult with no imagination that she is, but he swears it's true. Could Gaz's favorite toy have really come to life and run off into the woods? Yeah, we just saw it happen, pay attention. Fortunately though, exiting the forest is super simple. Super Mario RPG was composed by Yoko Shimamura, who considers this game to be a turning point in what would become an exceptionally distinguished career, to say the least. It's easy to see why. Her score lives up to Square's pedigree. It remixes several of Koji Kondo's iconic classics. It incorporates those classics into its own leitmotifs, expanding on Mario's world. It uses repetition to set the scene. The first time you hear this song, the Mushroom Kingdom is under siege. The second time, arrows are raining down on Rose Town. The third time, nothing is outwardly wrong, but this song has been so effectively linked with trouble in paradise that just stepping foot in Seaside Town is unsettling. The fact that everyone's pretending nothing's wrong makes it even worse. Here's this guy, standing on the desk, questioning the integrity of the artificial world in which he's trapped. But of course, Beware the Forest's Mushrooms is the most famous piece of music in the game. This song flips the usual tone on its head. Mario RPG is mostly whimsical fun, with an air of mystery that you never quite put away. But the Forest Maze music is more thoughtful, more spiraling, more introspective. But it's still grounded in Mario's world. The epic tone is backed by this buoyant bass line, so reminiscent of the one that plays back in the Mushroom Kingdom. The whole soundtrack is excellent, but this is a masterpiece among masterpieces, and it hasn't aged a day since 96. Unfortunately, the same probably can't be said for these, and I quote, excellent 3D graphics. The characters look like balloon animals, the environments look like dithered plastic, everything's built out of grainy images with the pixels just indecipherably melding into each other. Did anyone really think this looked good? Okay, yeah, I thought this game looked good. Because it freaking did! Here's the thing, this is not what old school video games looked like. It's how they're remembered, it's how they look if you play them now, it's even how new retro throwback games look, but it's not what they looked like at the time. No, they looked more like this. The signal degradation inherent to video standards of the time, combined with the scan lines of a CRT television to hide pixels, to blend gradients, to make fake transparency look real. You can actually see every single pixel, which means it looks nothing like it did uh, back in the 90s. Those, those hash patterns are actually on, a, on the televisions of the day would have blurred together into very nice uh, gradients. When you see an old school game on a modern TV, you can count every individual pixel. But really, this razor sharp quality isn't such an issue for pixel art. I mean, it's become the accepted default look of old school games for a reason. It might not be what they were quote unquote supposed to look like, but it's got a lot of charm. However, if you put a game that was pre-rendered on an ACM workstation in the mid 90s on a modern display, it just doesn't work anymore. These assets look like low resolution pictures because that's literally what they are. And being able to see every pixel exposes all their imperfections. Critics at the time might have chided Yoshi's Island for not being modern enough. But in the long run, these cutting edge visuals emblematic of the mid 90s haven't held up as well. And this is a big reason why. I don't normally care for scanline filters, but with a game like this, it really does make a difference. Now Mario looks like a rounded 3D character instead of a mass of messy colored blocks. Now the environment blends together so much more believably. Now the game looks like it's supposed to. But I'm not gonna keep it like this. Kind of afraid of what YouTube's encoder would do to a scanline filter. But hey, give it a try the next time you play a pre-rendered game. Gino, whose real name is... this, is a guardian from the heavens. You kind of get the feeling there's a lot he can't tell you. But he's not malicious about it. That first scene where we see him learning to walk is a great indication of what makes him so charming. Gino might be a benevolent vessel of the gods, 
but the vessel he's inhabiting is a wooden doll. The style and timing of Gino's attacks are unique to him, and as we saw earlier, that doll packs a punch. With perfect timing, Gino Whirl can one-hit KO anything that's not a boss. Gino Boost massively buffs both attack and defense. Gino Flash sees him backflip, turn into a cannon, and just... He is the fastest, flashiest, and hardest-hitting member of the team. But that marionette he calls a body can't take a lot of hits. He's a glass cannon. Square really broke the mold when they made this character. There's no one else quite like him. No better icon of Mario RPG itself. And no one left for Smash Brothers that would mean quite as much to me. But heck, even if it never happens, I'll just be happy somebody remembers Mega Smilex. As much as this game builds on Mario's lore, it's the way Square blends those iconic elements with brand new characters and concepts that defines this game's legacy. Gino, meanwhile, defines the game's overarching narrative. He explains that far above the sky, there exists a place called the Star Road, where wishes are granted. But when that sword pierced the heavens, the Star Road was shattered, and wishes can no longer be fulfilled. So now the goal is clear. Collect the seven stars, repel Smithy's invasion, restore the Star Road. What Gino reveals here is the actual legend of the seven stars. And it's not revealed until you're a third of the way into the game. The plot keeps you in the dark for hours, building a sense of mystery and suspense. But just as importantly, this decision keeps the game's pacing from getting bogged down with exposition. The embodiment of this legend is Star Hill, a place caught between hope and melancholy. Bizarre star-shaped flowers dot the landscape, enormous celestial doors jut out of the ground at unnatural angles. The terrain itself is otherworldly, littered with fallen stars, each one representing a wish that has gone unfulfilled. You can even eavesdrop on some of these wishes, highlighting the innermost desires of even the most obscure characters. Seriously though, it's wild how based on a single line, you'll know who it came from. It's another one of those things that reminds you of what's gone wrong with this world, and the familiarity you have with the people living there pushes you forward to fix it. One wish even comes from a member of the party, and that's a cute little character beat. But it turns out to be a disarming one, because in the very next area... Oh, this is so well done. Mallow holds back his tears. He's always trying to do the right thing, but he still struggles with himself. But this time, when push comes to shove, he puts on a brave face. He grows as a person. And eventually, the Star Road doesn't make his wish come true. He makes it come true. And when he finally meets his parents, it rains in a city above the clouds. I'm not saying this is some kind of landmark story, but standards become standards for a reason. As a kid playing this for the first time, I had never seen a game with such a strong narrative focus. Mallow's struggle, growth, and redemption made him so much more compelling. Now I know the fact that I was so young has a lot to do with why I see him this way, but that doesn't make it sting any less that this was the only game he ever appeared in. Bowser is shunted from his role as the main villain, and left with no Koopa Troop to command. You run into him trying to rebuild his army early on, but those numbers dwindle until Mario finds his archenemy completely alone and in literal tears over how much he misses his castle, how much he misses his crew, and how much he misses the good old days. And so for the first time in the series, Bowser teams up with the good guys. Uh, sort of. In his mind, he didn't join Mario's party, Mario joined his. Just like Mario's the established hero, Bowser is the abominable villain. Everyone's terrified of him on principle. However, Bowser's brutish, bossy attitude is written as a front for his insecurities. Which is not only hilarious, it's endearing. He revels in brute force, but writes a literal haiku about how misunderstood he feels in his own internal monologue. It's no coincidence that this blustering, wannabe tough guy portrayal of the character would stick in future Mario RPGs and even in the main series. And it's a good thing Bowser is characterized so well, because when it comes to his actual in-game utility, Bowser kind of sucks. On paper, he's a tank. He's got great physical strength and a deep pool of HP. He also has a propensity for throwing his subordinates around. 
But his other stats leave a lot to be desired, and his high HP only does so much to offset his meddling defense. He might be able to hit hard, but he's so slow. He also only gets four special moves, and while a few of them can invoke status effects, the game is easy enough that strategy like that isn't really necessary. Super Mario Bros. was barely a decade old, but the fact that every single game seemed to share that game's plot was already becoming a joke. So Mario RPG turns it into a running gag. Like Bowser has kidnapped Toadstool so many times at this point that it's become routine. There are lots of fun jokes about this, but my favorite one is more subtle. Mario's house is literally at the foot of Bowser's Keep, positioned squarely between it and the Mushroom Kingdom. Guess he figured he could save some time on his commute. But after she's rescued at the midpoint of the game, Toadstool insists that she's coming along to help, and she sneaks out of the castle. It's cool to see the princess get out of that damsel in distress role and carry some agency. But it is only some agency. She doesn't really have much of a role to play from here. In fact, by the time she joins the party, she only actually has seven unique lines of dialogue left in the whole game. But you know, that actually kind of mirrors our protagonist, doesn't it? Her personality isn't nearly as well defined as Bowser's, but it doesn't have to be. While everyone else has an intrinsic motivation and some degree of an arc, Mario and Toadstool are helping because they're the good guys. And does she ever help? She helps a lot. Too much. While her defensive stats may leave something to be desired, it's simple enough to buff that with armor and accessories, and they're not so lacking that she'd ever become a liability. But she is exceptional at one thing. Toadstool is what I gleam RPG fans would call a white mage, and her healing comes with absolutely no drawbacks. Her two healing spells will both pretty much always max out your HP, cure all status ailments, cost next to nothing to use, oh, and she starts with both of them. This basically means that from the moment you get Toadstool, you should have a chance to heal your entire party to full health on every turn. She, quite frankly, breaks what little balance there was in the battle system. Or does she? Look, there's a tremendous difference in the way you approach a game you know from one that you don't. Especially, ESPECIALLY, if it's something you've been playing since you were very young. And as someone who values replayability so much, I've never really gotten that experience of coming back to an old favorite after a long time. I replay my favorite games so much they never fade to memory. But that amount of familiarity with the game is inevitably going to skew my perspective on it. Speaking of which, the isometric viewpoint was disorienting to players even in 96, but I've played this game for so many decades it doesn't bother me. Oh, and I would definitely have some pointed criticism at how easy it is to get lost in places like the Kiro Sewers if I didn't know this labyrinth like the back of my hand. Like a lot of RPGs of this era, combat can be slow-paced, especially late in the game when you just have to wait while hordes of enemies throw flashy specials at you. But, like, I always go into it expecting that. So this probably isn't as easy of a game as I think it is. Trying to see it from a new player's perspective, especially a kid's, I gotta think that Toadstool is the way she is for a reason. Mario RPG gets a lot more challenging after you find the princess. That difficulty curve is going to fly higher and higher. And I know for a fact that as a kid with no RPG experience, having Toadstool to lean on was the only reason I was able to break through a lot of that challenge my first time playing. I mean, she still didn't stop me from getting stuck, because it's not like I'd know where to find 60 flower points by the time I get to her, the way I do now. So as a slightly more seasoned gamer now, of course Toadstool is OP as heck to me, but she's also sort of an optional easy mode. I got no problem putting her on the bench. Come to think of it, I guess Bowser might be the same thing. His strong physical stats make him a safer alternative to Geno. I mean, it makes sense. This was the party that I gravitated toward when I was a kid. Mario RPG might streamline the genre's conventions, but it always does this with a thoughtful approach that doesn't overly diminish their depth or appeal. But so far removed from the context of the time, it may not be obvious why Mario RPG took this approach. Like I said at the top of the episode, to put it mildly, RPGs were niche in 1996. Today, Square's games are thought of as these paragons of the Super Nintendo's legacy, but platformers and fighting games ruled the mid-90s with an iron fist. Nintendo Power's review of the game even tried to downplay the term RPG. They knew it was a tough sell, and I guess it was. In Mario RPG's first month on the US market, it sold 200,000 copies, and even that was worth bragging about. And that's why the game is designed the way it is. It assumes players will be familiar with this, but not necessarily that. And I'm living proof that it worked. 
While this may be Baby's first RPG, I was Baby, and it was my first RPG. Despite that, I could not only wrap my head around it, I fell head over heels for it. Mario is inherently an action game, so that's what his physics and controls are modeled on. Tap B to jump, hold Y to run. And that makes this a lot faster than your standard role-playing protagonist. In an era where it seemed like platformers were the default genre of gaming, this made Mario RPG so much more familiar and approachable to me than... Yeah, that would have been. To this day, it feels a little weird if a game doesn't have a jump button. But running and jumping is hardly the only thing to do outside of battle. Mario RPG is absolutely bursting with minigames, breaking up the traditional RPG game loop with a breadth of variety. Most of the minigames are tied in nicely to the overarching plot, but not only can they be replayed, they even offer incentive to do so. For instance, the first time you climb Booster Hill, you're just pursuing the titular madman. But on a replay, you can catch beetles and trade them in for prizes. Ooh, and then there's this weird optional area called the Pipe Vault. It's really strange, you can skip it entirely and go onto the next screen, but hang on, the freaking map is teasing that there's something beneath it. So if we venture down here, we find a traditional side-scrolling platformer level built in Mario RPG's 3D isometric perspective. This feels really experimental, like something the team might have prototyped during development just to see how the engine would handle it. Pushing through the pipe vault gets us to... Yoster Isle? Actually, this is endemic of the game's localization. What we call Yoshi's Island has a more colorful name in Japan, but we weren't so concerned with maintaining brand consistency back in the 90s, which means that in this game, a number of Mario staples get more direct translations, or even brand new names. Super Mario RPG was localized by the legendary Ted Woolsey, and in fact, it would be his last game script to date. I use that term with intention just as much as I bring him up with affection. This script wasn't translated, it was localized. Typical of Woolsey's style, the dialogue has so much personality and color, I wouldn't want to change a thing. I mean, I learned a lot of colloquialisms from it. But typical of this era, the context when it comes to game mechanics can be a little bit off. For more on that, let's get back to Yoster Isle. When you first arrive, talking to any of the Yoshis just makes them go... But there's one guy who goes like... It turns out that Boshi here has become a dominant dictator of the island races. Everyone wants to race together, but he insists it's got to be one-on-one -on -one against him. So you've got to beat him in a race, by tapping A and B in time with the rhythm. However, there are no on-screen prompts whatsoever, and the game commits quite a localization hiccup while conveying what you're actually supposed to do. Press A and B alternately along with the rhythm. The tighter the rhythm, the faster you go. I always read this as, you, the player, will need to tap the buttons faster when the rhythm speeds up. But the you isn't referring to you, it's referring to your character. And I never understood that until I was writing this script, actually. A better translation might be something like this. Press A and B alternatively in time with the rhythm. The better your timing, the faster Yoshi will go. Maybe I'd read it differently if I was playing it for the first time now, but I just couldn't wrap my head around this one. I basically won just by spamming cookies. Boshi is the best part of this whole thing. He is to Yoshi what Wario is to Mario. I mean, literally, his Japanese name is Washi. His design is so over the top, and he's not really a bad guy, but he's a competitive brash tryhard who, even after he's defeated, tells you to race someone slow so you can win. Basing an entire arc of the story on Yoshi's Island would have been so cool. Unfortunately, Yoster Isle turns out to just be a very flavorful side quest. But you know, it's alright. It gave us some more fun characters, and importantly for the legacy of the internet, it also gave us this guy. I'm glad Yoshi's made it into this game. Also, I love how even a race of dinosaurs on a secluded island still receives spam mail. Alright, one more minigame to talk about. If you backtrack to the Mushroom Kingdom late in the game, you can buy this kid's Game Boy off of him for 500 coins. It doesn't tie into the plot, there's no incentive to play it, it's just a bonus for looking around. The game does this a lot. It's sort of endearingly experimental. It goes on weird little tangents in a way that the meticulously designed docked industry of today usually can't get away with. As enjoyable as the game is outside of battle, how can Mario RPG maintain the feel of an action game through something as indirect as turn-based combat? Well, you better watch out, because I'm talking about TIME TIPS! Every move in your arsenal can be substantially improved with a well-timed press of the attack button. So, check out this dopey little punch. But now, once more with timing. Just the visuals, the sharp sound effect, everything just snaps! 
It's so simple and yet it's so freaking satisfying. And defense works the same way. You can time blocks to reduce damage. There's even a surprising amount of nuance to this. You can partially whiff a hit and still improve an attack, still reduce some damage, or you can get it frame perfect, nail a much harder, or even cut off damage entirely. Mario RPG appealed to my action-oriented tastes on such a fundamental level, the fact that this taught me what an RPG was supposed to be kind of ruined the way I would approach the rest of the genre. In something like this, I'm just selecting moves from a list and watching them play out. But with this, it's like I'm actually involved, I'm actually doing something, my skill is making a difference, and you know how important that is to me. It's not like it's hard, it's not like it should matter, but it's just enough to trick my dumb brain into thinking I'm actually doing something. So can you imagine what it was like to be taught that an RPG was supposed to present its battles like this? and then to play something more traditional, and have this keep happening over and over and over again. Mario RPG features no random battles. You touch an enemy on the overworld, you start a battle. The game never just yanks you out of what you're doing and puts you in combat. I think random battles can have a place and a function, but for my tastes, the lack of them makes this game so much less tedious and, importantly, more replayable. Mario RPG accommodates lower-level runs, jumping and weaving your way between enemies, and smashing through bosses on the back of your own skill. And also, how insanely OP Mario's jump can get. But there is one case where you can defeat enemies without actually fighting them. Item boxes very occasionally contain Starmen, which function exactly like they do in Mario's mainline games. But you're not just knocking these enemies off the map, you're one-hit KOing mobs you'd normally have to fight in turn-based combat, and banking the same experience for it. Mario and Pals can level up off of invincibility, which is another nice way to marry action platformers with RPGs. To that end, it is notable that the game starts out throwing you in the deep end, putting you in turn-based battles without bothering to explain how they work, and trusting that the game design itself will be enough for you to at least get your bearings. But once you get to more complex concepts, the game steps in and has Toad explain things. Item usage, hit points, inventory management. And this sets a precedent. Toad will always be there to shed some light on a new concept. However, he always does this, and I can't stress this enough, optionally. Maybe you've played the game a dozen times before. Maybe you're familiar with how RPGs work and don't need it explained. Maybe you just want to figure it out for yourself. Whatever the case may be, Mario RPG always gives you the option to skip the tutorial. Future games would not always abide by these ideals. This also goes for progression. I mean, let's not overstate this, the map screen is linear, so it's not usually a mystery where you should go next. But still, when you see a trio of Sniffets talking about someone named Booster, who's taken a hostage described as the princess who fell from the sky, Mallow doesn't pop out of your party here and go, Hey Mario, do you think maybe that princess could possibly maybe be Toadstool? We better go back to the map screen and check it out, huh? No. The tutorializing is over. The game trusts you. You know what to do. Spend literally all your money on fireworks, then immediately trade them all to a little girl for a shiny rock. Yeah! Also, you can always get a hint from Frog Fears just if you do get lost. It's good. It's good. The game actually spends an entire arc on Booster. The character's most obvious analog is Wario, but where Wario is greedy, lazy, and obsessed with becoming rich, Booster was born rich, the seventh generation of his family line. He spent his whole life here, in this tower, playing games with his sniffets, and a lady type falling from the sky is the most exciting thing that's ever happened to him. Yet despite his opulence, and despite his antagonistic role, he's not exactly a villain. He's not really bad on purpose. Booster is just incredibly ignorant, incredibly lacking in social graces, and incredibly unhinged. He's another great character, who was only ever in one game. You know, Mario RPG gave me so many weirdly specific, but like, extremely formative memories. Like, at one point you're supposed to use clues to decode a password. Unfortunately, these clues were all fairly obtuse, and I was eight. So how did Nintendo want me to figure out this impossible puzzle? Call the Nintendo Tips Hotline for only $1.99 per minute! And they say microtransactions are recent. But how did I learn the password was pearls? For the first time, I used the so-called information superhighway to beat a game. And that's why you don't have tips hotlines anymore. I'd also never seen a game be so self-aware. It plays with the conventions of its platform, its series, its genre, and even the medium of video games themselves. You know how your party members in RPGs will just, like, disappear into your player character? Other RPGs do this as a matter of convenience, and while I'm sure that's why this game does it too, it seems to be the case, in-universe, that Mario's friends are in his pockets. Ha! 
who are okay. There's an optional sequence where you can stay in a luxury resort hotel, but if you stay too long and can't pay off your room, Mario is forced to work to pay off his tab, and now you're the one showing the room. You're the one hoping for a tip. But moreover, the game isn't afraid to lock you here. You can't leave, you can't take a break, you can't escape, you're at work. A couple might come in, argue, talk to the receptionist, bicker at each other, go look at the room, come back down, bicker again, leave the hotel, gallivant right back into the hotel, and you just have to stand there, walking in place with a smile on your face like the disposable, unimportant, non-player character you are. CAPITALISM! <clears throat> Sometimes Mario RPG even makes references outside of gaming. Here's what happens when you find the sixth star piece. Now remember, a player will have seen this sequence five times by this point. The star twinkles and spins, that triumphant music sweeps in, and... The Axum Rangers freaking steal it! To see a video game so directly, so unabashedly parody something that I actually knew, something that I was obsessed with, something every kid I knew was obsessed with, was one of those things that caused me to rush out of the house, run down the street, and tell my friends, No, really, dude, you have to come over. They're making fun of Power Rangers in a Mario game! Of course, I didn't know it at the time, but the developers were probably referring to their own childhood, not mine. It might have been new in the West, but Super Sentai, the show that Saban adapted into Power Rangers, had been running in Japan since 1975. And I noticed this time, the bass line in the Axum Rangers theme sounds a whole lot like an early Sentai theme. But if I want to talk about formative memories, this room is kind of the epitome of it. It's just two ledges and a curtain. But when Mario goes behind it, this happens. You can run around this room all you like, but as soon as you try to leave... It's a cool little easter egg, right? It was so much more to me. For some reason, I loved this. I had a specific save slot just for this, just so I could come see it again. Why? I was too little for the NES. My Mario 1 didn't even look like this, it looked like this. And yet something about the low fidelity music, the flat 2D art that, even on a CRT, looked like something from a bygone age. The fact that I knew the game was referencing some ancient version of itself just fascinated me. 25 years later, I think I know why I loved it so much. I can be positively obsessive about charting, analyzing, and understanding the ebbs and flows, the iterations, and the chronology of the things that I love. I love the way settings and character designs change, the way the tone and timbre of a long-running franchise evolves over time, evolves with the times. I love legacy. I think that's why a lot of things that some others despise as, like, nostalgia pandering will hit different for me. I mean, I love being pandered to as much as the next guy, don't get me wrong, but I'll find this stuff fascinating for things I'm not even a fan of. And video games, by the grace of their interactivity, the persistence of long-running franchises, and the progression of the technology that powers them, tend to evolve, change, grow, iterate, and reflect back like nothing else can. The player is always perched atop the fourth wall. And for the most part, that's more compelling than fiction to me. I was a little tiny baby child who'd come in at the tail end of 16-bit. I'd completely missed the initial Mario phenomenon of the 80s. So to me, this was all that Mario was. And I liked it. But it always seemed a little bit vanilla, a little bit fundamental, a little bit basic compared to my favorite games. I know now how revolutionary these titles really were, but I lacked the context back then to see them that way. But when Mario went behind that curtain, it was the first time I had ever seen a game break through the fourth wall and celebrate its own legacy as a video game. This was Mario's final appearance on the Super Nintendo. It was one of the last games I played before the next generation hit, and it has always felt to me like an epilogue for the 16-bit era. And speaking of epilogues, Mario and his friends do liberate Bowser's Keep. They do confront Exor, and ultimately, here come the spoilers, they repel Smithy and find all seven stars. With this mission fulfilled, the entity we've been calling Gino leaves Gaz's favorite toy behind, and invokes the power of the seven stars to restore the Star Road. And with that...
And then we get to see what becomes of everyone. Bowser rebuilding his castle, Mallow taking his place in the kingdom, characters major and minor finding their peace. 25 years later, there's something simultaneously heartwarming and kind of heartbreaking about all this. In too many cases, this would be the final glimpse we'd ever have of these characters. I feel like there's so much more I wanted to say. The truth is, for so many reasons, this script has been one of the most challenging I've ever written. It's been a tough year, and I don't need to tell you why. With everything going on, it hasn't always been easy to find the motivation to keep pushing forward, and I have at times struggled with whether I even had it in me to talk about a game like this. Gameplay and skill mastery and all that stuff is always paramount for me, and I worried I might not be able to convey why I love a game like this. I still don't know if I've done a good enough job, but I do know that at 4.30 in the morning, I finished this game and saw this ending for the first time in at least a decade. I remembered childhood best friends who I haven't seen in twice as long. I remembered playing this with them, how much we loved this game, how many times I'd replay the last boss just so I could see the ending again. I loved it so much I even recorded it on a video. This game and this experience was important to me. Before this, Mario was just another game I enjoyed playing, but in one fell swoop I had characters I could invest in, a deeper world to obsess over, a legacy to learn about, and before that I didn't know that was something a video game could do by itself. Mario RPG is the reason I became a fan of this series. I finally understood the pedigree of Nintendo's mascot, why he was so beloved, why he was so important, and what his world was all about. This was my Mario. This was my favorite Mario game. For about four months. Mario RPG came out in May, but in September, Mario changed forever. Suddenly, Princess Toadstool had a first name. Suddenly, this wasn't her castle, this was. Suddenly, Mario was not a blue-collar hero from Brooklyn. He was a whimsical, screaming Italian! I can't imagine it any other way now. Super Mario 64 might have presented a different vision of Mario's world, but it was a billion times more influential. This was a last minute release in a niche genre on a dying console, but this was the standard against which we would judge every 3D game over the course of the next generation. Less than a year later, Square and Nintendo went their separate ways, and all of a sudden, RPGs weren't so niche anymore. All of a sudden, an upstart console that nobody expected to seriously compete with Sega and Nintendo wasn't just competing, the PlayStation was winning. This marked an era of revolution after revolution after revolution. Landmark titles would redefine genres, redefine the boundaries of what a game could be. By the end of that generation, everyone knew games could tell compelling stories, could feature rich world building, could be about more than just gameplay. Platformers changed forever, RPGs changed forever, adventure games changed forever, horror games changed forever, video games changed forever. But this one stayed the same. So what's become of this collaboration between two of gaming's superpowers? What is the legacy of the game that taught me about legacy? While it would be a bridge much too far to accuse a Mario game of all things of falling into obscurity, the evolution of the industry in the years since its release makes it very much a product of its specific moment in time. There's no other year that Mario RPG could have come out being what it was. Games weren't like this before 1996, and they would never be like this again. And that's not always easy to reconcile. Nostalgia will make you love the games that you grew up with on a deeper level than anyone else could, but you'll love them in a way that no one else will. And that's okay. Be aware of your biases, and embrace the positives that this nostalgic perspective brings you. Just don't be surprised if later entries in the series don't live up to your childhood memories, or when people a little younger or a little older don't see them the way that you do. I'm glad I get to have the perspective that I do, and I'll always be thankful that I got to experience Mario RPG the way I did at the time I did. I think its most ardent fans carry that torch all these years later specifically because so much of what made it special, the tone it struck, the world it presented, the characters it introduced, were one game wonders. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Outside of a few cameos, references, and delusional wishful thinking on my part, they've never returned. There never was a direct sequel, and more than likely, there never will be. But it sure did look like it was gonna happen. 
the very next year, I remember seeing this. I'd played the first game when I was eight, I'd just turned to nine, and already Super Mario RPG 2 was on its way. And you can see that episode right now, a week early, over at the TGC Patreon. Thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, you keep geeking, I'll keep crutiquing.